You've probably heard the term critical race theory thrown around a lot lately. It's that thing everyone seems to have a strong opinion about, but most couldn't tell you what it is. Some portray it as a boogeyman warping our children's minds, others as the key to finally understanding racism. So let's cut through the noise and get to the heart of it. Imagine those classic images from the civil rights era. Police dogs, segregated lunch counters, easy to condemn, right? But critical race theory, or CRT, asks a tougher question. What if racism didn't disappear when those signs came down? Scholars like Derek Bell argued that racism isn't just about individual hate in people's hearts, although that sadly exists. It's deeper. It's about how unfairness can be baked into our laws, schools, and workplaces, sometimes in ways that seem totally fair on the surface, but subtly benefit those whose ancestors wrote the rules of the game. It's a shift in thinking, and frankly, it can feel super uncomfortable, especially if you've been taught that success is all about hard work, regardless of your background. So when we say racism is more than individual prejudice, what exactly does that mean? Critical race theory isn't denying bad apples exist, those sadly never go out of season, but its focus is broader. Imagine it like you're investigating a crooked casino where the games are rigged. You wouldn't just look at the shady dealer, right? You'd want to understand the whole rigged system that allows and maybe even encourages them to cheat. CRT looks beyond the surface level prejudice of a single person and instead examines the underlying structures and institutions that perpetuate racial inequality. These structures can be legal, like discriminatory housing policies, or economic, like racial disparities in wealth that limit access to quality education. Derek Bell wasn't some ivory tower academic. He was a civil rights lawyer who had walked the walk. He'd fought the battles, won the landmark legal cases to desegregate schools. But over time, Bell saw a troubling pattern. The victories were important, but didn't create a truly level playing field. Black children were now in the same schools as white children, but those schools were still often vastly unequal due to underlying economic and racial disparities in their communities. These disparities, rooted in a history of discriminatory practices like redlining, meant black families often had fewer resources to support their children's education. Bell developed a concept he called interest convergence. The basic idea is kind of cynical, yet sadly borne out by history. Meaningful change for black Americans often only happens when it also benefits powerful white people. Think about how desegregation served political interests during the Cold War, when America needed to project a better image on the world stage. This is not, CRT argues, how true justice should work, but it's a pattern Bell saw throughout his long career working for racial equality. By highlighting these historical and ongoing power dynamics, CRT challenges the idea that racism is simply a matter of individual bias and instead argues that it is embedded within the very fabric of American society. Now this doesn't mean nothing can change or that individual effort is meaningless, but to get to the real root of the problem, CRT demands we look beyond individuals. So how does the idea of systemic racism actually play out in real life? Picture this. Two families are looking to buy a house. They both have similar incomes, work hard, and dream of the perfect home and safe neighborhood to raise their kids. Sounds fair, right? But here's the twist critical race theory asks us to consider. What if decades ago, one family had their grandparents denied a home loan in a particular neighborhood solely due to their race? It was called redlining, Banks literally drew red lines on maps marking areas where they wouldn't offer mortgages to black families. Redlining may be illegal now, but the effects linger. That family denied a house couldn't build wealth the same way as a white family who benefited. This disadvantage cascades. Limited housing options meant overcrowded neighborhoods and underfunded schools for black children. It also meant they couldn't pass down the kind of financial cushion that helps you pay for college maybe start that small business, or weather a crisis. Now, decades later, that family, no matter how hard they work, starts the home buying process at a disadvantage due to policies long gone, but whose echoes are painfully felt. This is not to blame homeowners today, but to highlight how seemingly neutral systems that perpetuate past injustices hide beneath the surface of a so-called colorblind society. 
Similarly, look at school funding often tied to property taxes. Neighborhoods with high property values have more resources for their schools, newer libraries, more extracurriculars, all those things that enhance quality education. These affluent neighborhoods are often overwhelmingly white due to that historical legacy of discriminatory housing policies. Again, this isn't about blaming individual teachers or students. It's about recognizing the interconnected systems that perpetuate inequality even when overt racist actions are now less tolerated. Derek Bell used a powerful phrase, the faces at the bottom of the well. This forces us to stop thinking about racism only in terms of grand historical narratives and instead focus on the everyday struggles and barriers people of color face due to systems that, while claiming fairness, were never truly designed to be fair to everyone. This perspective doesn't invalidate personal effort or celebrate victimhood. Instead, it demands we acknowledge the starting lines aren't equal. And if we're serious about equality, we must confront this uncomfortable truth. It's important to understand that critical race theory doesn't just stop at pointing out the problem. However, the backlash it often faces exposes a raw nerve in our society. You might wonder why a fairly complex legal theory gets everyone so heated. After all, analyzing how laws and institutions can have discriminatory effects, even if unintentionally, isn't the same as marching around with hateful signs. But when CRT steps out of the law school classroom and into the messy world of politics and culture wars, that's when things get explosive. Here's where it gets thorny. CRT fundamentally challenges the American myth of a pure meritocracy. You know, the pull yourself up by your bootstraps idea, that if you just work hard enough, you'll succeed, regardless of race. CRT forces us to confront the fact that bootstraps aren't equal opportunities. And for many people of color, the game has felt rigged for centuries. This is especially uncomfortable for those who've benefited, even unknowingly, from systems designed to favor their own group. Acknowledging even a tiny amount of unearned privilege can be deeply unsettling to someone's sense of self and their belief in a just world. Sadly, in today's polarized climate, it's easier to attack than to engage with complex ideas. CRT gets misrepresented as teaching all white people are inherently racist or that it seeks to make children feel guilt and shame. This caricature completely misses the point and poisons any chance for a real conversation about systemic racism. It essentially shuts down the very inquiry that defines true scholarship. It also reveals a fear that if we pull at this thread, if we start examining where unearned advantages lie, the whole social order we take as normal might start to unravel. This distortion of CRT isn't happening by accident. It's a calculated weapon in our ongoing culture wars. Fear-mongering about CRT, often without even bothering to define it correctly, becomes a way to attack discussions of race in schools, diversity training in workplaces, and any effort that strives for a more equitable and truly inclusive society. It's a bleak picture. Does this mean CRT is a cynical dead end? That all hope for change is lost? It would be easy to end on a cynical note, lamenting how uncomfortable truths get distorted, creating more division instead of bridges. However, giving in to despair is what those attacking CRT would like. It's important to remember that at its heart, critical race theory is about analysis, not attacks. It shines a light on the often invisible structures of power, not so we can perpetuate guilt and resentment, but so we can actively dismantle them and build a more truly just society for everyone. Derek Bell wasn't interested in simply making white people feel bad. Yes, CRT asks hard questions about privilege and complicity, but its ultimate goal is to identify the systems creating barriers so we can remove them. We must also acknowledge that CRT isn't perfect. It's been criticized for sometimes being overly pessimistic, lacking a clear roadmap for achieving its goals. Some feel its intense focus on systems can underplay individual agency and the importance of building interracial coalitions for change. These criticisms hold value. CRT, like any intellectual tool, shouldn't be treated like dogma. Engaging with critics, having those tough debates, is what keeps a field of inquiry vital. However, what remains undeniable is that even though the era Bell started his work in is gone, more subtle forms of systemic racism and inequality persist. Whether it's in policing, the wealth gap, or healthcare disparities, 
the legacy of historical disadvantage continues to hold far too many people back. CRT forces us to ask, if we're serious about that American promise of liberty and justice for all, aren't we obligated to keep examining where the ideal and the reality still don't align? We can't change the past, but CRT teaches us that we're not as helplessly trapped by it as we might think. True progress demands we understand how seemingly neutral systems can mask deeply ingrained power imbalances so we can stop simply addressing symptoms and instead cure the underlying disease of social injustice. Derek Bell, throughout his long and brilliant career, forced us to see the world differently. He showed us that racism isn't just about individual acts of hate, but is woven into the very fabric of our society. He didn't offer easy answers or comfortable narratives. Instead, he demanded that we question the very definition of fairness and who it serves. His work within critical race theory sparked a much needed and deeply uncomfortable national conversation about the gap between our ideals as a nation and the lived reality for far too many, particularly people of color. While CRT is hotly debated and sometimes deliberately distorted, this controversy is itself proof of its power. Ideas that don't challenge the status quo rarely get such a visceral reaction. It's far easier to cling to comforting myths or to demonize those who point out inconvenient truths than to engage in the hard work of dismantling systems of oppression, even those we might unintentionally benefit from. Bell's legacy challenges us to become uncomfortable. It invites us to move beyond simplistic slogans and engage with the complexities of race, power, and the pursuit of a truly just society. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of critical race theory. Whether you ultimately fully embrace its conclusions or find it flawed, I hope it has sparked deeper thought about the structures that shape our world. Let's not let fear shut down debate, but let the pursuit of a more equitable future guide us. Please share your thoughts in the comments. Do you find CRT a valuable tool for understanding the world? What are its potential limitations? Like and share this video to keep the discussion alive, and let's remember that progress comes not from silencing challenging ideas, but by having the courage to confront them head on.